Hello again. This is the continuation of your discussion on hepatic cirrhosis. So, we're talking about the stages of Lenex cirrhosis. So, there are three. Accumulation of fats and then alcoholic hepatitis. Then you have your end-stage cirrhosis. So, in the first stage, the liver becomes fatty. So, on that stage, you should expect an increase already of the liver enzymes, such as your SGPT and your SGOP. The patient has the possibility to be asymptomatic and then this stage is still reversible. This stage is usually diagnosed incidentally during physical examinations wherein hepatomegaly is palpated by the practitioner. Second, in your alcoholic hepatitis, there is already inflammation and then necrosis occur. The patient may be asymptomatic with mild symptoms, sometimes indigestion or loss of appetite. On the third stage, the end stage cirrhosis, there's already fibrotic tissue replacing the normal tissues. This is uh, manifested by signs of portal hypertension, impaired digestion, and absorption. For the signs of portal hypertension, you may have your esophageal varices. And then for your impaired digestion and absorption, that is usually because of the congestion that occurs in the organs, related also to the increase of the pressure in the portal vein. Now, so this is what happens okay, in alcohol again. So the fatty liver, then liver fibrosis, and then you will have your cirrhosis. So this is for your Lanex cirrhosis. So these are spider angiomas, uh, the dilation of your superficial veins, superficial blood vessels, related to uh, the increased pressure in the portal vein, which caused the blood to pull to the small blood vessels or the dependent blood vessels in other parts of the body. Then you have your palmar erythema. Then of course your ascites. So take note that if you're handling patients with ascites, you need to weigh the patient daily. And then you need to measure the abdominal girth of the patient at the same position, usually in supine position for that matter. And then uh, the tape measure is placed at the level of the umbilicus. The abdominal girth monitoring would be able to help on the fluid status monitoring of the patient. Then diagnostic studies. So in severe parenchymal dysfunction, remember once the liver is already inflamed or damaged, okay, the liver parenchyma would be damaged. So the laboratories will be looking at is your albumin and globulin. There is a decrease of your serum albumin, then a pro probable increase of your serum globulin. Then for the enzyme test, these are all indications of liver damage, your alkaline phosphatase, your AST, ALT, which is congruent to SGPT, SGOT, and then your GGT. So these levels increase in liver damage. Your GGT may also be increased in kidney or bone damage. However, if uh, congruent with other laboratories here, you would suspect really liver damage. Then there will be a decrease of serum cholinesterase levels because that would be an indication that the liver cells are already damaged. Okay, so these enzyme tests are an indication that your liver cells are damaged. Then your bilirubin test is expected to be increased. Prothrombin time is increased, or in other words, prolonged. Okay, there is increased risk for bleeding. Ultrasound scanning is done, okay, because if your patient has a liver problem, the first diagnostic test imaging study usually done is ultrasound. And then you have your CD MRI and then your radioisotope liver scans, which would give you more detailed images, okay, especially your CD and MRI, which will be able to give you detailed images of your liver. Your radioisotope liver scans, on the other hand, will be able to detect on the metabolism activity on the liver. Then you have your ABG analysis. So acid-base imbalance here. The most common ones that occur among patients with liver cirrhosis is your metabolic acidosis. Okay, metabolic because liver is after all in charge of metabolism. So some of the metabolic byproducts will be imbalanced. And then acidosis due to the failure of bicarbonate production which supposedly balances the acid. And then the failure to excrete the acid. So metabolic acidosis is common for these patients. Medical management. So antacids, your H2 antagonist for example. So you have your ranitidine for that. What's the purpose? It's to decrease your gastric acid uh, distress 
or to decrease gastric distress and minimize the possibility of GI bleeding. Vitamins and nutritional supplements. So this promotes healing of your damaged liver cells and hopefully to improve the general nutritional status of the patient. Potassium sparing diuretics, because remember, in this condition, we have increase of your aldosterone. Increase of aldosterone leads to increase of sodium, but a decrease of your potassium. So we want to spare potassium this time. Potassium sparing diuretic, spironolactone or triamterine. Then adequate diet is recommended for the patient. And obviously, a big no-no to the alcohol. Okay, so one... Um, Therapeutic effect of diuretics here that we are expecting is that there will be a decrease of ascites. However, if our patient is already manifesting with hepatorenal syndrome, this type of diuretics may not be of help. Added to that, among the four classifications of diuretics, you have your loop, your osmotic, okay, you have your thiazide diuretics, and then your potassium sparing diuretic. Your potassium sparing diuretic is among those with weak effects. Okay, so uh, sometimes patient needs to be monitored closely. If not, they are placed on dialysis if ever they are not responding to this treatment. Also, mild to moderate cirrhosis is being treated with colchicine. However, recent studies have shown that colchicine has not improved the outcomes of patients with liver cirrhosis. Colchicine is actually a drug for gout. It uh, decreases your uric acid. Um, but in this condition in cirrhosis, the effect is uh, not yet fully explained. However, studies have shown again that its effect on the outcomes is not good. It's, it's not, it does not even improve the outcomes. What I mean. Then you have your, for patients with end-stage liver disease with cirrhosis, okay, there are evidences on the use of the herb milk thistle. And then for those with biliary cirrhosis, of course, to treat the underlying cause, okay, we manage the stones. Okay, so the purpose of the stone management is to ensure the patency of bile flow in such a way that it will not mm, aggravate the condition of your liver. Then nursing management, we promote rest for this patient. Improve nutritional status. Okay, adequate nutrition may be provided through total parenteral nutrition, nasogastric tube feeding, Okay, but if we're talking about encephalopathy again, okay, we decrease protein in the diet. Provide skin care. You need to turn the patient to sides okay, every two hours do so. Reduce the risk for injury. Okay, then monitor and manage potential complications. Bleeding and hemorrhage. So advise your patient no dark colored foods. Okay, your toothbrush should not be very sharp. Then you monitor for hepatic encephalopathy. Again, you need to check for the level of consciousness. Neurovital signs would be better. And then check for fluid volume excess. Okay, make sure that intake and output is measured accurately. Because if not, you will have problems with the fluid balance. Hepatic encephalopathy is an indication of progressive cirrhosis. This is the result from the inability of the liver to convert ammonia to urea. And your ammonia is neurotoxic to the CNS. Again, your protein supposedly is converted to ammonia and ammonia prior to excretion is converted to urea. In this case, in your liver cirrhosis, your liver is unable to convert your ammonia to urea for excretion. For that reason, it accumulates in the central nervous system. And in that accumulation in the central nervous system, okay, the effect tends to be cumulative and then it becomes neurotoxic. Okay, it can uh, cause your encephalopathy and as mentioned earlier, coma. So signs of hepatic encephalopathy, four stages. At first, your patient may have tremors, slurring of speech, impaired decision making. Second stage, drowsiness, loss of sphincter control. They could not control their bowels, they could not control their urination. And there will be involuntary flapping or asterexis. And then third stage, dramatic confusion, somnolence. Okay, they fall asleep easily or they are very difficult to arouse. On the fourth stage is already your coma. Okay, they're unresponsive. GCS 3. Okay, GCS 3 to 8 for that matter. So as you can see, the progression of the signs and symptoms okay, uh, usually manifest as signs of neurologic problems. Now, for patients with hemorrhage secondary to esophageal viruses, diet, non-irritating food, of course, no spicy food, and total parenteral nutrition usually. 
okay, these patients, if there is active bleeding, is placed on MPO. So to augment for the nutritional needs of the patient, they are placed on TPN. And then the TPN needs to be on a central line. Then emergency treatment, fluid replacement. When I say fluid replacement, isotonic fluids, then your blood products. Then we give your vasoconstrictors. Examples of this are your sandostatin and your vasopressin. In minimal bleeding, minimal to moderate bleeding, we usually use your tranexamic acid in the clinical area. So these medications can halt the bleeding. Now, one thing that you need to note is that your patients who are bleeding are not supposed to receive your anticoagulants, your antiplatelet, and then your thrombolytic agents because that will aggravate the bleeding of your patient. Then, balloon tamponade. Okay? Familiar balloon tamponade that we discussed in under GI bleeding. Okay, so the balloon tamponade will place pressure on the bleeding side. Gastric vein occlusion. Okay? It may be done through uh, a thrombus to occlude the gastric vein, so to stop the bleeding. Then we have your sclerotherapy, which is an injection of your sclerosing agent. Okay, now try to find out what a sclerosing agent is and how does it work. Then there may be emergency surgical shunt. Okay, so for example, you have your portosystemic shunt. So this shunt, when I say shunt, is an artificial passageway. So to relieve the portal hypertension, a shunt is created between the portal vein and then the inferior vena cava. Okay, that is to allow for drainage of the veins or the venous blood okay, from the portal circulation going towards your inferior vena cava. So, this is an image of your esophageal varices. As you can see, they appear like varicosities in your esophagus, okay, awaiting to rupture. We don't want that to rupture. Okay, so esophageal varices are usually located on the distal esophagus. Then we have your Singstake and Blakemore tube. Okay, if you can recall, Singstake and Blakemore and Minnesota tube, the tubes which are capable of applying your tamponade. Then you have your endoscopic sclerotherapy. Okay, so this is the injection of your sclerotic, sclerosing agent. Okay, so I've asked you the question, what does this sclerosing agent do and how does it help our patient with varices for that matter? Management of ascites and fluid retention. Patient is advised to be in complete bed rest. Why? Patient has a tendency to have shortness of breathing because of the pressure of the ascitic fluid towards the diaphragm. Fluid and sodium are restricted. Patients are weighed daily along with your abdominal girth. And then we give diuretics. So diuretic of choice is your spironolactone aldactone, which is a potassium sparing diuretic. Then we transfuse your albumin because earlier we said that there is a decrease of albumin and we equate albumin to osmotic pressure. So if we want the fluids okay, that causes ascites, the fluids that cause ascites to go back to the intravascular space, okay, we would have your albumin. Okay, albumin will increase the osmotic pressure and facilitate re-entry of the fluids in the intravascular space. You also assess for degree of edema, okay, your pitting edema. Then, other than that, you also have your peritoneal venous shunt. Okay, so you have your Levine or Denver, Denver shunt, I mean. So the image here in the background shows your shunt. So as you can see, the shunt is from the uh, GI tract going towards your vena cava. That bypasses your portal vein in such a way that the portal vein will not be congested. Okay? Your tips, your tips is shown on the next slide. And then we can also have your therapeutic parasynthesis. So when I say therapeutic parasynthesis, you are extracting the, par the fluids inside the peritoneum okay, to relieve the patient of the pressure. This is your TIPS. Your TIPS is transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. So there's a shunt inserted here in your uh, veins in the liver. So as you can see, it tries to bypass this blood vessel okay, to facilitate the drainage of the blood towards your inferior vena cava. So again, that's your transjugular intrahepatic 
portosystemic shunt. Okay, and again, a bypass shunt. Then you have your parasynthesis. So as you can see, fluids are being extracted from the abdomen to relieve pressure. Uh, nursing responsibilities. You weigh the patient before and after the procedure. Then obtain baseline vital signs. Then monitor vital signs every 15 minutes until stable. Let client void before the procedure. And that is for the purpose that prevents the accidental puncture of your bladder. We don't want the bladder to be full, might be get punctured. This is a invasive procedure, an invasive procedure. So obtain sign consent. Position the client. Okay. Best to position the abdomen on a dependent portion, which means that it is wise for you to position your patient on left lateral position to ensure that the fluids will be deposited on the left side and drain on the left. Other practitioners would recommend the patient to be in seating position. Okay. The patient, if cannot tolerate these positions, could be placed on supine position, okay. preferably with the head of bed elevator. Drain the fluid slowly. Rapid drainage may result to circular, circulatory imbalance. Okay, limit drainage to one to two liters. Apply dressing when needle is removed. Okay, that's uh, that's to ensure that the dressing or the site of puncture will not have contamination. Okay, we don't want peritonitis to occur in this patient as much as possible. Then record amount and characteristic. Normally, okay, it should be straw colored. Okay, normally, it's straw colored or it's even clear. Once it becomes cloudy, you should inform the physician that's characteristic of your peritonitis. Or once its appearance becomes pineapple juice-like, okay, that's characteristic of your peritonitis. Management for your hepatic encephalopathy. Remember, the cause in hepatic encephalopathy is the increase of your urea, increase of your ammonia, I mean, due to the failure of the liver to convert ammonia to urea. What do we give these patients? We give neomycin. Uh, class neomycin is an antibiotic, but if you will be asked what is the rationale, why this is given for a patient with hepatic encephalopathy, that is to decrease the blood ammonia levels. Lactulose. Lactulose is a laxative. Increases your GI. Okay, um, what's the reason why it's given in uh, liver problem? Also to decrease your ammonia level. Okay. No protein in the diet temporarily until ammonia level decreases. Because if not, okay, your protein will continue to convert towards ammonia. Other medications that may be given to the patient. Pain medications, opioids, barbiturates, and sedatives. It says you're used with caution. What do you think is the reason? Why does my patient, or why as nurses, we need to be cautious in administering this drug among patients? with liver problems. If your patient's class is on opioids, barbiturates, and sedatives, one effect is CNS, depression. So if your patient has liver cirrhosis, you know that one risk is hepatic encephalopathy. Meaning, if my patient is on these pain medications, I will not be able to detect right away if my patient would have changes on the level of consciousness. So for that reason, these medications are used with caution. Antiemetics, if your patient tends to have nausea and vomit. Antacids, to decrease gastric discomfort and to decrease the risk for gastric bleeding. And vitamin K, to address your coagulation problems. That will be all for your liver cirrhosis. On the next discussion, we'll be talking about pancreatitis. Thank you very much for your kind attention.